Thank you everyone for being here today, for joining us after lunch too. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Megan, um, for the introduction and for being our room moderator here today. My name is Tori Vandalin. I am the project manager with Reliance. You all just met Megan a moment ago, and I'm gonna ask our leadership team to introduce themselves. And while you're introducing yourself, can you tell us a little bit about uh, who we are as Reliance? Sure. Hi, I'm Sandra Enriquez, and I'm one of the founding and managing partners of Reliance. And um, we can talk about this more, but we came into existence, was it in 2013-ish, around there, um, shortly after the Ray Rice um, situation. And we had the opportunity to talk with the NFL and um, have them support the work of prevention, specifically in areas that we felt there were gaps in the movement. And so we've changed and tried different things. We're really looking at sport early on, at communications, at policy. Um, and, you know, we continue to do all of that and have really um, increased our focus in working with business and corporate sector. Um, we know that none of us, no business, uh, is immune to sexual uh, harassment, misconduct, or abuse. And so we feel like everybody needs to be in this. It's not just our work, but it's everyone's work. And Reliance is dedicated also to helping other um, systems to improve themselves and obviously do whatever they can to prevent sexual violence. Thank you, Sandra. My name is Monika johnson Hostler, and I'm also uh, a co-founder and current managing partner. Um, and I... I think Sandra laid the groundwork of how we started this work. Um, the thing that I would add that is always the poignant point for me is we came together as three individual organizations who had our own identity in the anti-sexual violence world and really made a conscious decision to be in partnership bringing all of our best efforts and focus, focusing on where we had built our strength as an organization. And I think it's a great... Um, example of how we all can be doing our work in partnership to ensure that whatever your strengths are is really where you come together and then filling in the gaps. And so I would say that's the best thing that we've done as Reliance Partners is ensuring that we're lifting each other up, our organizations up, but collectively creating an entity that we feel was feel it, filling a gap in our decentralized um, anti-sexual violence movement. And so we've been very fortunate, as Sandra said, to look at sport, the business and um excuse me, uh, sector, but also to be very clear that our base and constituency and our expertise is built on our collective, we'll just say lots of years uh, of doing this work, but also recognizing that we do this work alongside each of you. Our coalitions, our rape crisis centers is really what gives us the strength, um, both in our knowledge base, but also we bring that to the table when we're working with other partners and clients that we have organizations in all 56 state and territories. And so that includes you in the way that we describe the work that we do at Reliance. Thank you, hi, welcome everyone. I'm Karen Baker, also a managing partner for Reliance. And ditto to what uh, Sandra and Monica said. And also I want to add, when the NFL first uh, funded Reliance, and by the way, Reliance doesn't take any government funding, so that allows us to be more flexible. When they first gave us the money, they had an idea that they wanted to fund hotlines, but we said, we're not sure that's really what sexual assault survivors need at this time, and they said, well, okay, you're the experts, what do they need? You know, like, basically, we have money for you, you decide what to do with it. That was pretty refreshing. And also, we share um, some of that with the field through grants. Hi, I'm Yolanda Edrington. I'm the Managing Director of Reliance. Uh, and adding on to some of the founding information, I came along after that. Uh, leading into the project that Uber was talking about at the lunch uh, is where I came in at talking about the taxonomy and the data collection system uh, and we continue to build off of that product and branching into other products that came from there. Thank you all for that great introduction. Um, want to acknowledge some of our team members who aren't in the room with us right now, but who are at the conference with us. This work would not be possible without them too. And um, also had mentioned um, 
uh, some stuff upcoming for folks. So I really want to encourage folks to go to the closing plenary tomorrow where uh, Karen, Monica, and Sandra will be on stage with some exciting announcements. And then uh, we also have a session with Uber tomorrow where we'll dive a little bit deeper into that work that Yolanda had mentioned. Um, one of the things that our team has been talking about and working on is this topic of accountability, which I imagine is why most of you are in the room with us today. Um, so just a really uh, broad starter question for you all. What does accountability mean for us? Tori, I just, I wanted to say something before we even get into that question, because I think, um, you know, we didn't really say that at the beginning. And um, I, this workshop, it's, a, I don't remember, what's the title, whatever it is, but it's about looking at all or nothing responses to harm. Um, and it's something that we at Reliance have spent time talking about. Every time that a case comes up, that you hear about something, we talk about that, and just like you've been hearing at this conference about considering as a movement different ways that people can be held accountable, we think that that also applies to the business and corporate sector. And oftentimes what we see um, is kind of an all or nothing approach. So either um, a survivor's you know, coming forward is minimized or ignored, not addressed, or it may be the opposite of, you know, very punitive, like the person who's being accused gets fired or whatever. And, you know, we believe that some of those things don't solve the problem, um, that they might, they certainly don't solve the problem when survivors' experiences are minimized or disregarded. And so this is what led us to, I think, you know, have these conversations, which also inform the work that we're doing um, and the kinds of uh, supports that I think Reliance has dedicated itself to offer for businesses in the corporate sector. So with that, now maybe, can you repeat your question, Tori? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And thank you for laying that, that groundwork with us too. What does accountability mean to us? What does that look like? Um, what's come up in this conversation that we think are really key cornerstones to a conversation about accountability? Um, thank you for laying the groundwork, Sandra. And I, I think one of the things that I would also say is, while we've been having this conversation, I believe many of you have been having a conversation, and we we also kind of are at a place where Sandra and I were talking earlier that this conference, the readiness seems very different, and people seem hungry to have this conversation. And I think that's clearly shown by the number of you in this room. Um, but we've we've traditionally defined accountability um, as punishment. We've which means we didn't define it. We really just used a synonym that we believed was the way that you would look at it. And so essentially, accountability was punishable by using the criminal legal system. That's traditionally how our work was steeped in accountability. Now, certainly over the years, we've moved to other forms. I mean, the work that ATSA has done around treatment. Um, so we've broadened our horizons, but I think our conversations in now are almost a decade of being reliance has been how do we fully unfold this conversation as a field? Um, we certainly know the criminal legal system has not worked for any um, if not many uh, people, we, we know that from our experience. And we also know the all or nothing approach is also what keeps so many people from coming forward. And so for me, it forces us into a conversation around accountability um, that could include punishment, but doesn't have to be punishment. And I personally, um, and I think Pony said it this morning, if we think about the way our schools are created, we've created every accountability um, in our country as punitive. And I think this conversation allows us to talk about accountability as truly the person taking accountable for the actions had and realizing that that person is truly, that's not the whole of the person. 
And so asking that we have conversations to really fully roll out accountability to me means that. It means first start having a conversation for us of what does accountability look for, look like for us to be responsive to survivors who already have been coming to our organizations for decades, asking for other ways of healing and addressing the harm that's happened to them. And oftentimes we talk about accountability only from the side of the person who's caused harm. And so for me, accountability is also about our accountability in this work to be responsive to the requests that have been made to discuss fully accountability. Yeah, and when I think about um, our work being survivor-centered, um, I think this is an area where we need to have a lot more options. There are so many different situations, so many different things that survivors need and want and experience. And so again, just to have that all or nothing, two options, both very extreme, um, really misses a lot of people. I know I've talked with a lot of survivors over the years, um, and many of them have not said, I want that person locked up, I want that person fired, I want that person kicked out of school. But what they have said is, I want that behavior to stop, I don't want anybody else to experience that. So I think our solutions or our options need to um, follow with that. Like, what things can we do that would help a person change their behavior? And doing nothing doesn't change behavior. And I'm not sure that locking up would change behavior in the ways that we would want. So what are some things that we can do in that middle area um, to provide more options and more flexibility and some real change and growth? Because we do believe that people can change and grow. Prevention is possible in a systemic way. It's also possible in an individual way. So to me, that's what accountability means, um, having lots of different options and doing what works given the circumstances and the people involved. Yeah, being a fourth person, <laughs> um, other than ditto, but just uh, realizing that each individual is different. I know that's hard uh, when we're talking about a full system system, being able to give individual choices uh, can be hard, but it doesn't mean that it's not doable. Uh, and then some level of accountability for me may be punitive to someone else. Uh, there, But that is me, and that might be what I want. This other person may not want that, and that's okay too, because uh, I wanted to make sure that we wrap that part up too, that that may be okay for that person if that is what that person wants. Um, and then that's what's just for them. Uh, I don't want us to think that that's not what we're saying, but that is for that individual. Um, but I think what we're all saying is that it's options and that it's uh, for that individual to say what that option is for. Um, yeah, so that's what I want to wrap up there. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, Monica, I heard you say about how it's an accountability to us in the movement too. And this reminds me of conversations we've had about how this call to expand options that we can't just do nothing or throw something away, whether that is incarcerating or firing someone. We can't throw people out of community. We heard a lot of that from Tony Porter this morning too. Um, and I know that we've had conversations about how this is not a new call. It's been a call that has been ignored primarily by black women and black survivors. Do folks have any thoughts that they want to expand on around that? Yeah. So um, before passing down, uh, and I'm glad with, with we are kind of moving into this part of the conversation too, because we have had this on blogs and different things like that on a part for us too within our own organizations, because right now we were a little bit talking about other people's organizations, but there's a level of accountability too within our own organizations where we start talking about oppression and the things that we're doing to our own colleagues. So we're not over here, just like organizations aren't over there, like they, they have to do something to make sure that sexual violence, harassment, or abuse is not happening in their organizations as if it's not happening in ours, just like oppression is happening in that organization is also happening in ours. So we have a level of accountability to our coworkers, just like someone else has a level of accountability in theirs. So that's a part of the conversation that I don't think that we always are ready to have. And so I hope that this part, when we move to a Q&A for, for you all too, that we have that part of the conversation of uh, in this movement, what part of accountability are we having within our own organizations and the way that we're uh, treating our own colleagues? And I'm saying our because I'm a, I work within the movement just like you work within the movement. So it's a it's a bull fan for me. 
Just, I think a lot of the points were covered. A couple of things I wanted to add is that, you know, part of why it's been so important for us to do this work um, within, you know, the business and corporate sector and other systems and sport and all of that is really because if the behavior is ignored or if uh, a very punitive approach is taken, you really haven't solved the problem. You're just kind of moving it around like a pass the harasser, go to the next place, go to, and the, the behavior isn't addressed and no preventative measures are taken. So I think that, um, you know, there's research that shows that if someone causes harm, um, that, that, that with help and intervention that they will not repeat that behavior. Not everyone. We know that there are folks who um, maybe can't be helped, but that's going to be in the minority. And so it's really important that we um, help different kinds of businesses to have the tools and understanding to, under, to, to be able to do that, right? And so um, I think that, you know, to ask ourselves and help the businesses that we work with to answer the question about what is it going to take to prevent harm from happening? What's it going to take? And can, is that something that we can integrate into our approaches? And I would so thank you, uh, Tori, for lifting up. My, um, and Yolanda, uh, I feel strongly that we have to be accountable in our for ourselves, to ourselves, among ourselves as well. Um, and we know that and we'll continue throughout this to reference black women who very early in the anti-sexual violence movement um, articulated clearly that black women and black communities would be left behind by using a completely criminal, legal, punitive um, outcome for anyone who came to our organizations um, to seek justice, help, and healing alike. And so I think we, for me, it is important that we're grounded um, by the amazing folk that will continue to call their names in the room, like Beth Ritchie, um, who who have and. I, the thing I pre appreciate about Beth Ritchie is she reminds us that she told the movement that that long ago. And, and that grounds me as a reminder, as someone who is approaching 30 years in this work, that this is not a new conversation. And as I said earlier, I think that there is a readiness and a hunger to have the conversation. And this morning's plenary really opened the door to acknowledge that the work that we're doing at Reliance is certainly steeped and rooted in our anti-sexual violence and sexual harassment and victim-centered approaches. But it is also a very very clear call for us to businesses that we're working with that we're talking about intersection. We're coming to the table articulating that we're also talking about the ways in which marginalized communities are treated in their in their um, businesses. And, and that's not necessarily work we've done as a movement. We've all worked with businesses, including our government partners, and not called into question that accountability. And so I think one of the benefits of reliance of not having government money, we literally can call everybody to the table. And the beauty about the businesses that we're working with is they're coming to us to talk about accountability and to create structure systems, whether that's reporting systems, but also we'll get to as well as what does it look like to work with both the person who's caused harm and the person who was harmed within their business structure. And so I, I think that we'll continue to uplift those things. But I also think that this is about how do we keep people whole and also how do we prevent this from happening again? Do you all have other thoughts about uh, what does accountability mean to you? And if we see hands, we'll run a microphone to you. Um, you had talked about how it was also just as important to make sure that you're um, holding accountability within your organization as well. Um, so what processes um, have you brainstormed or have in place um, or would recommend for an um, organizational staff regarding accountability, addressing um, organizational harm or trauma that's happened previously? And I guess all in all, um, healing and then prevention um, further um, to, pre uh, to prevent further harm. Our, um, as like main focus 
is to do prevention on the ground, um, but you can't really pour from an empty cup if, you know, your staff all in all are not in a place because of harm that's happened previously. Well, I'll just say that um, one of the things that we've done at um, PCAR and NSVRC, now at Respect Together, um, we've brought in racial justice consultants that have met uh, with different groups of staff. They might meet with supervisors and then meet with non-supervisors so that people can have um, honest conversations. And then we try to follow up and address some of those issues or acknowledge some of the past harms or change some of the policies or procedures. Um, it's a it's constant work because, um, like, we, we have conversations, for instance, about what does safety mean? Like, are we a safe environment? And different people have different definitions of what feels safe. So I'm not sure that we can ever create an environment where 100% of people feel perfectly safe all the time. But I think we can get closer and closer to that. So it's continuing to really listen deeply and provide lots of different types of opportunities. Some people are not comfortable speaking up in groups, so is there a way that they can uh, anonymously provide some feedback, or is there a, a trusted person they can go to? So those are a few of the things that we've done. Um, great question, and I would say for, for me, I will be very transparent. It, it was hindsight for me. Uh, one, uh, in a, so, so Thinking about this organizationally was through an exit interview. And I, those are probably the best nuggets I ever receive is what people say when they're exiting. And I always let them send it to me how they won't want to. So if they want to do it face to face, if they want to email it, if they want to mail it, because it allows people the full comfort um, to, to say what they need to say, leaving the organization. Um, and as a black woman leading an organization, um, I certainly had black women say to me that they had not felt comfortable in our organization, um, but didn't want to put me as a black woman in a position where it could easily be seen as I was favored, fav creating favoritism structures um, for black women who were feeling oppressed by other white women who were in leadership. That's a hard thing to hear, that when you believe that you're opening the door and creating a, a, a an environment where people can be honest, especially people who look like me. Um, it, but it was a it was an amazing gift to be given that, so that I could openly talk about as a black woman. Certainly, I am in a significant amount of organizational power and privilege as a black woman. But I also recognize and clearly articulated by a black woman who left our organization is she felt like she was watching me also live in the marginalized space. Um, by just naturally white women in this work had far more power and in their opinions, far more experience. And so we started to really talk very early on um, as we talk about race, sexual orientation and identity as much as we do about sexual violence. And so for me, it's also about the introduction and onboarding is about the intersectionality of our work. And so if you lay that for us, we believe if we lay that groundwork at the beginning and we ask questions directly in our interview, so we know what's coming. So we started our interview. How do you define race and oppression? Give us an example. Um, how do, why do you believe people are poor is a question that I think throw people off the most because it requires you to dig deeper into people's subconscious of what they really believe about the way systems of oppression also work because most people can define isms, but it doesn't mean that they've thought about structurally what it looks like when you can create harm inside of an organization, especially one led by a person who identifies from a marginalized community. So we start at the interview, and then our supervision also is built in to have these conversations. It is certainly not perfect. I agree with uh, Karen. I think it's a work in progress. And then I believe almost all of us should have on speed dial um, organizational trauma specialists who clearly understand the framework that we do our work in. So whether that's group work or individualized work. And the last thing that I will say that I'm a strong believer of, um, and I have somebody who works on my staff in the room, um, I strongly tell people every day, we are rooted in our own healing practices. And that means part of my check-in is, is do you have a way to heal and take care of yourself? 
work that into your schedule so that it is built into the belief of the organization. Because I certainly, lastly, will say I agree, you cannot pour from an empty cup and we often empty ourselves and create, which in turn creates toxic and oppressive environments inside of our organizations. So not a fix, but certainly some possibilities to consider. Hi. Um, so this is a question more about the community side of accountability. And um, like one thing that I have tended to think is that for, for a lot of people, or at least a lot of the people um, who come from like my same situation in society, white people of a certain class and so on, um, the first response when something seems to be going wrong is to call the police or to sue. And so like those systems are the first ones that people turn to, which seems to me like those systems should be the last resort. Um, so the, like, so I sort of think about it like the, the accountability impulse is very thin. And so my question is really about how do we like pad up that accountability impulse? Like what are, like so for, for example, um, an Airbnb opened up across the street from me, and which is really annoying. Um, <laughs> uh, I hate it for losing a neighbor. <laughs> but anytime there's like you know a party or something loud, my neighbors are all like, "Call the police!" Not let's go talk to that person, you know, and see if we can sort this out. So I wonder if you have any, um, just any anything to any advice to give about how to like sort of rebuild those community relations that can serve as the the web within which the accountability can happen, and also sort of changing the norm about where and when in the process you call the police or resort to these systemic responses. I mean, I think that's a very specific question, which probably would require you know. I would say in any situation, people to come together in advance and try and explore what those um, solutions might be. But first of all, you need to answer the question, I think, of like, what is it that you want to achieve? You want that to stop? I mean, obviously, most of the time you aren't that excited about an Airbnb being next door, right? Because you just know that there are a lot of different people and it could be a repeat of it. So are there any other kinds of um, policy solutions that can be sought with the owner of the Airbnb? Are there things that can be put in place? Um, I, I, when you were first asking the question, it um, made me think of some of the work that we've done at Reliance in terms of um, we've had clients come to us with situations where um, maybe they've been in the media around harm that's been happening um, and then come to us and said, what should we do about these um, cases of, of, of survivors coming forward and different people being, um, you know, accused of being, of, of causing the harm, et cetera. And I think that, and they didn't know and, you know, we have had to figure things out as we go because, you know, we, all work, have worked, spent our careers working on behalf of survivors. And um, so I think it's about trying to figure out what do we want to achieve. So with a particular client that we worked with, you know, they had a third party uh, investigator who went and looked into and came back with their um, analysis of what had happened. You know, the first thing that we did was we said, well, we want to take a look at that when it's completed. And when we took a look at it, we were like, oh, this person really doesn't understand or know anything about sexual assault. It's an attorney, but they clearly don't have any background in sexual assault. So we came forward and gave our own recommendations. Like, we think this is off the mark because this is not actually the way sexual violence happens or it sounds like there's some victim blaming going on or it sounds like, you know, whatever there was that we noticed. And then from there, you know, we again, kind of tried to look at what do we think can happen here? Is it um, a case that's so extreme or, or repeat uh, offenses that we feel that that person does probably, they do need to look at a more punitive like termination, suspension or something like that? Or is it an instance where we believe that there could be some assistance offered to prevent 
the behavior from reoccurring. And, you know, again, it was a lot of um, looking at and trying to figure out and really working with this business to help them, um, I think, build their own capacity to recognize what's going on. And I think part of what, what we want to do at Reliance, you know, somebody um, mentioned the taxonomy. Did someone mix? Yeah. Okay, the taxonomy. Thank you, Yolanda. So the, the, the sexual uh, violence and misconduct um, taxonomy. But uh, the first thing is to understand what's happening, right? And so I think in terms of the other question is understand what's happening. You know, if it's with employees, if it's with clients, whoever it's with, understand what's going on because that's the first step in addressing it and in taking preventative steps. And then um, from there, what are the resources and options available to us? So for this particular client, we help them to understand really what's the difference between the behaviors, you know, through using that taxonomy um, from what they understood from these reports. And then uh, from there, we said, like, made our recommendations. Ultimately, they make the final decision. But they did. We were really pleased because they did hear us and listen to our recommendations. I think 99 or 100 percent of what we recommended, they went with it and said, "Okay, we're going to get this person. We're going to we're going to offer counseling for any of the survivors that came forward." And that allowed us to partner with some of our rape crisis centers that had the survivors who'd been picked, impacted in their areas. Um, and Reliance did that, and Reliance would like to continue to do that, build um, a network with all of you or, that are in communities to help with some of these, because we're not in every community. We don't want to do your work. We know you all are the experts in that work day to day, but we do want to create those bridges. Uh, and then the next thing that we did was we um, work with them to help get these folks through what we were calling psychoeducation. And I just want to call out that part of how we developed um, this approach and model was through using some of the work of Mimi Kim um, around her accountability ladder. And we went to Mimi school a long time ago, many, many years ago, and kind of tried to um, create something that didn't exist for us in the field like you know, that we, in as sexual assault service providers, we weren't providing those things. So we're like, well, can we create something? And as far as we know, it's been very effective. So we came up with an approach to address and help these people. We, we said, there are no guarantees, but there never are. And so here's some tools, and here are some folks that can help with that. And... Um, so, so far, so good. We'll see. I mean, I don't know. It's all new terrain. We're all just out there trying to bring what we know. And I think part of what um, we've learned and we want to encourage for people in the field is that we have a lot of knowledge and we want to help other people with the knowledge that we have in bringing that to the work that they do. Do we know all of it? No, but nobody does. It's something new that we have to create, and I think that's kind of an invitation for all of you to to do that and step out and see yourselves, because we also didn't know, but what we did do is we listened, right? We listened and we said, if we want a different outcome, we don't want to pass the harasser, we don't want to ignore the behavior, we don't want to fire away out of everything, we want something different, what can we do? And so you kind of back into some solutions. What I'm hearing from you all up here and then also from, from all of us in the room too is that um, this acknowledgement and a little bit of heaviness that the current system that we're stuck in isn't working. Um, it's not working for survivors, it's not working for communities, and it's not working for prevention either. Thinking about that, um, and I, I, I know that we've already spoken about this. We've heard this from the room too. Um, so if we can just briefly talk about if there are any whys that we're missing in this conversation. So 
why why is this conversation important? Why is it important that uh, we have alternatives to our current all or nothing response? Why is it important that we ditch all or nothing <laughs> and expand options for survivors and for communities? I don't know your name. Uh, could you say your name? Eve. So I think Eve started us off on this conversation. Uh, Eve gave us the why. You're, if you only have two options, calling the police and suing is your why. Like I've been sitting here just thinking about um, how horrible it must be to have only two options. The only thing I have in my tool belt is calling the police and suing. That's a terrible small tool belt. We can't even hang pictures with that. We need way more than that, right, to hang a picture. You know, we need all these different things to hang a picture. And that's how I like to think about things, because uh, that's helped me in my thought process. When I'm going to hang a picture up, if, I had, if all I have is a hammer and all I have is a nail, that's not going to work because I might need an anchor. I might need these things and all these different things. You know, my dad's a general contractor, so you know that, like me saying it out loud. <laughs> I need way more than that because that picture might be too heavy and I don't have the right thing behind. I'm not looking for, uh, what is it, the, the stud. Right, because my tool, I don't have enough things in my tool belt. So that's the why. So community is part of it. Adding on who, who, who's involved in my community? Who can I reach out to? Uh, do I even know that neighbor? Maybe Eve doesn't know that neighbor, but maybe um, Tori does know the neighbor that owns the property. So that's how we have to reach out. And really, Eve is that company. So we're reliant, even though we're all sitting here and we might represent a home, another home office because we talked about that at the beginning of how the knowledge and everything that we come with of uh, the different spaces that we come to. But here we represent reliance and we are representing you uh, in that space because you come with us. And so you're part of our community and your knowledge is part of our knowledge, just like our knowledge is part of your knowledge. So as we talk about the why, we have to tap into that. So our tool belt is, is very big. We have more responses than calling the police and suing, and so do you. You have all of these neighbors, you have all of these different resources, you have Airbnb, you have all of these different things, they have guidelines. That homeowner has guidelines. You have all these different resources more than just calling the police and suing. And not to pick on Eve, but you, you asked your question. <laughs> um, so that's more than our why. Just like in uh, every company has more than that, just that w those whys that they have. So um, just because, you know, Eve got to ask that question, but I was hoping that Eve was the last question because I knew it was going to take us into our next question. <laughs> so, so thank goodness no one else raised their hand. And I could use my, my dad analogy built off of her too. Well, that's why I was like, oh, let me say it first. Um, so, so that's what I have there. And I was hoping you guys would laugh so that, you know, we're right after lunch, we're full and kind of wake us up. So I'll go ahead and pass the mic on down to my next person. Thanks, Yolanda. Um, I think another why is we have a lot of silos in our work. We've talked about some of them, th you know, this morning in the plenaries. But I think another silo is between um, victims and people who cause harm, or victim advocates and people who work with uh, people who have sexually offended. When we know in reality, sometimes the same person might fit both categories, or the same family might be dealing with both things. So life is a little bit messier. We, we don't have neat little boxes. And we need to look at everybody in a holistic way. And so, yeah, that's part of my why. Uh, and thank you, Yolanda, that was a great analogy because I was also hoping that Eve would be the last one too. Uh, be, because to, to build on the tool belt, it's also a muscle we have to build. Um, so many of us do everything by muscle memory, right? So not just our memory here, but physically we respond, whether, especially those of us who've been survivor centered and done advocacy work. We're responding from the natural muscle we've built. Most of you could get a call right now. You wouldn't have to even breathe before you could answer and move through your call because it's muscle memory. So it's both our intellectual memory, but it's also our muscle memory. And so building community and building community response is a muscle we have not built. 
And I would say that across community. In, in my generation, we have not built the community muscle to create community accountability. It's also not a conversation we have, which is why we started around how do we define accountability and built in our own um, individual and collective accountability to each other is just as invaluable. So I think it's a muscle we have to build. To Sandra's point for reliance, we literally had to back into what are alternatives to criminalization and civil or criminal lawsuits, because those are also the two things in the business sector. Um, in addition to the employer can fire, or if you were in our workshop yesterday, can be forced into arbitration, right? The, which arbitration looks like what? A criminal legal proceeding. So most of the muscles that we've built have all still been centered around the legal component. Well, that's not the only infrastructure in our society, but it's the infrastructure that we've used. Guess what else is an infrastructure? Family and community, that's an infrastructure that we haven't built ourselves into. Um, and we know, to, uh, to, to the work that many of us have mentioned, is treatment providers, both those who work in our agencies and those who provide treatment to those who've caused harm, they are a part of our system of care in this work. Another way to start looking at alternatives, because alternatives means what have the, what have we learned from what survivors have asked us for, but also what have we learned from what those who have caused harm have said and also asked for. Because if you talk to treatment providers, they're also asking for some things around self-actualization and understanding the full ramifications of harm that they've caused. So again, a muscle for us to build is what are the systems we already have access to, and then how is that connected to accountability? And Truthfully, and I think the best language is backing into it because we have not had forward motion on accountability outside of the criminal legal system. That is the only forward momentum that we've had in terms of accountability. And then lastly, I would also, for me, say one of the biggest whys is because survivors have told us that. And survivors, whether they're calling your hotline or they're in the businesses that we're working for, relationship is relationship, whether it's familiar or a chosen relationship. And in the workplace, there's just as many relationships that exist that that they may not want criminal legal penalties, but that's the only system we've built. It's the only system employers have also literally just transposed into the workplace is what we do um, in, in our society. And so that's the other why for me is because we've heard that people, survivors, want something different. And so now it's about us articulating what we've heard from them. And the number one thing that comes to mind for me is relationships matter, even for the person who's caused harm. If they're in relationship, it matters. And so the outcomes of the harm that's caused is just as important to those survivors. And that's what roots me into why we have to have this hard conversation. Thanks. Everybody said so much. Um, and I would just add that if we don't have alternatives, then we don't have a space for survivors to safely voice what their needs are, right? They can't safely voice what their needs are because of the responses that we have in place, which are all or nothing, um, which are really not about them, but mostly about self-preservation and protection and not getting sued and all of those kinds of things. And I think that no alternatives does mean that we're taking away autonomy from survivors. And um, as a as a movement and field that prides itself on survivor choices, which I already mentioned, but it's going to be a broken record situation because I really believe that, we offer very little. And because other kinds of systems, because we've seen this happen in the campus, in the higher institutions of higher education, their responses closely mirror the criminal legal system, which we already know doesn't work. So then we have the business sector also mirroring those kinds of responses, and they don't work. But everybody's mirroring the same thing. So um, we, we have to push for other approaches, other ways to hold people accountable, ways to really look at, get, the, get your heads out of the sand and look at what is really happening at your place because the truth is none of our organizations, even when those of us that work um, to prevent sexual harm, none of our organizations are immune from it. None of our organizations, no business is. We know that, right? That there's no family, nobody is immune from sexual violence. So what we have to do is take a look at it 
um, see where we have are at risk. What do we have in place? It's like at home, you put in place measures to keep you safer, right? And what that's what we need to do in, in, in other settings, in our work settings, in other business settings with clients that we might work with to help them improve that. What are the things that they need to do? And the only way to do it is to start by being really honest and taking a look at yourself. Um, taking a look at the structure, the culture of your organization. What is it that puts us at risk? You know, do we ignore what people say? Do we um, create a place where it's not safe to come forward? Do people know that if they come forward, they might get a very punitive response because people are going to start looking at them like, oh, that's the one that came forward, you know? So what are the kinds of things that we have in place. And that takes a lot of self-reflection. It's a lot of hard work. And I think something I was thinking about earlier, and I, I always think about with so many aspects of our work, is that you never arrive. <laughs> you just have to keep working at it. Because when you think you're there, you're not. Because there's always so much more to learn and grow and face and address. So um, I think, you know, and that's one of the things that we have to say. You know, people come to us and they want something really small. Well, this is interesting. When we first started working with the NFL money, you know, we, we were criticized for taking that money. How could you take that money? Because you know what happens over there. And, oh, they're just trying to use you um, for their, their image and all that. And, you know, the truth is, and I mentioned this last night, if you were in there, you know, most of the money we take is dirty anyway. So, <laughs> you know, like... What is it? Well, we want to use it to do something good, right? And, um, you know, and, and, and that's what we're doing is it's allowing us the opportunity to explore and do something. That's, again, what Reliance started for. That's why we came into existence was what are the areas? We don't want to replicate the work that's having in the, happening in the field. We want to lift up the work that's happening through the field in the field, and we do that through our grant program. We do that through trying to help create partnerships between many of you, your organizations and whoever we may be working with, because we know you're there in the community. Um, and we want to help create solutions so that we can stop sexual harassment, misconduct, and abuse wherever it happens. It doesn't matter if it's within sport, if it's within some kind of a professional association, a membership organization, it doesn't matter. We know it happens everywhere, so what is it that we can do? And, and again, we are committed to not replicating a system that we know is not effective and doesn't work. So that to get back to your question, Tori, that's why we need alternatives. <laughs> Thank you all so much for that. And, and Sandra, you had said this in your remarks that um, no system, no business, no sector, no industry is immune from sexual harassment and sexual assault. And that reminds me of something that we often say in the movement too, that is survivors exist in every space. And I had heard it in all of your responses too, just really grounding when we're talking about accountability and responses to harm, we're grounding it in the experiences, the impact, and the needs of survivors too. So I want um, our leadership team to think about and, and tell us some examples of what does justice mean for survivors? I think we've already covered the other part of that question of is it always firing or incarcerating? And I feel like it's a resounding no, it's not always firing or incarcerating. But to go back to Yolanda's amazing analogy, what are tools that we can add to our tool belt? Um, we all remember when, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago, command strips came on the market to hang pictures and we're like, whoa, we can do that now? Um, so what, what are those, whoa, we can do that now options that, um, that are really rooted in survivors' experiences and needs? So from working with uh, a few a few of our clients and just uh, being in some positive space with them, um, in some positive listening space, uh, them learning to hear survivors, like to hear survivors and to hear what um, survivors want in their office setting. Like um, if we're saying all of not 
all or nothing is not no longer an option and really should have never been. Uh, this person is not looking to be fired. Here's the things that uh, the survivor is asking to happen. Like um, Sandra brought up our psychoeducation um, sessions that we offer to for clients. And Sandra will give more information wrapped around that. Um, but those are some of the things like hearing. Like just actually listening is what, to me a start. Like should be the first space really just listening. And not listening to check the box, but listening to hear and to say, here's what we can do. And having that first baseline of like hearing a person and what they need to be able to move forward and to be have a, a positive or close to positive, uh, no, not close, but a positive work environment if you want me to stay. Now, a couple of examples I can think of in a workplace um, that would be, you know, short of firing. A survivor might say, um, well, could that person maybe work a different shift or a different location? Or um, I'd like to not be uh, in a one-on-one -on -one meeting with that person. You know? So those are some accommodations that can be made while at the same time uh, maybe the person who caused harm is getting that psychoeducational um, support that Sandra talked about. Thank you. It Funny enough, my answer was also first listen, um, second ask questions based on your listening. And so, and again, this is a practice that we all teach our first advocates when the first time you take a hotline is we say, what does active listening look like? How do you do that? And then ensuring that your questions are trauma informed and responsive to the person on the call, right? So not the list of questions, but what did that survivor say and use the prompts to meet their needs? And I think the same thing is going to be true in this conversation. Again, I'm going to ask you all as advocates to think about the conversations you've had with survivors. Do you know what they were asking you for? And then if they didn't articulate what they were asking for, did you have questions to ask them what they wanted or needed? And so that's that's the second step for me after the listening to hear them is ask questions to further further understand them and what their needs are. Um, and, I, and it feels simple, but I've not seen that reflective in how we do our work long term around accountability. Right. We do it in the space to hear them around. Do they want therapy? Do you want a rape kit? Right. Like we know what the nuances are for our work, but I don't know that we've again built the muscle to ask the question of what does justice and healing look like to you? Um, so again, to Karen's point, if a person is speaking about accommodations, are we trained to hear that and then be responsive to building out a process to recommend? to the employer. That's the work that Sandra's saying we're doing, right? We're, we're looking at what their um, investigations look like for those businesses who have investigations, and we're reading that to see what have survivors already told you that they need, and how do we help build those accommodations for survivors, which means it's not the same. Because guess what? Not All or nothing still means people can say, I want them fired, right? So, so we're not taking away any options. We're building our ability to really seek to understand what the breadth of options might be as that survivor is asking for. And then how do we start to build that inside of businesses, and that's, I think, for me, and I think it's, you know, one of the things I would ask you to juxtapose, because, of course, it'll come back to you for questions, is how can we replicate that in the work that you're doing so that survivors, whether they are reporting first to you as a service provider about their workplace, I heard a lot of that in my forced arbitration small group yesterday, is many of our agencies said we've had survivors' calls for workplace, but we didn't know what to do, right? We didn't have a resource for them. And and I think that's true. So that's going to, I'm preparing you for the question of like, how does, how can you be listening to understand to also help us collectively, again, back to our knowledge base, help businesses understand what kind of accommodations could they already build into their infrastructure um, while we are also exploring that with companies that we'll continue to share as we learn. But I also think that there's some on the ground learning we can do if we start asking the questions to seek to understand what accommodations or what outcomes do they really want. And then also giving them the resources to be able to answer that. Because what we know is some people, they're not coming to ask us for that, right? They're coming to, to us for support. They may be reporting to their supervisor just for report. That's also our work, right? How do we build inside of these the business sector, if the report is coming to you, how do they also not go to all or nothing? 
right? The person HR or the supervisor, how do they also not go all the way to all to nothing? How do they listen to what the survivor is asking for? And how do we collectively become okay with whatever place they are on the spectrum of their ask is? Uh, Because we also have to undo the all or nothing because that's generally what we're listening for. Thanks. I was so engaged in what everybody was saying that I didn't take my notes on what I wanted to say because, you know, I'm like, okay, well, I recovered that. All right. Anyway, a couple of things. I wanted to just come back to, um, you know, I was thinking right now as you were speaking, Monica, is, you know, the the options and choices, but it really is important to do that outside of the crisis whenever possible. So before you're in the crisis mode, which because that then it's hard because then the attorneys are saying, no, because we're going to get sued. No, because of liability, right? So I think as an organization or business, it's important to do as much of that because you know about situations that have happened in the past or that you saw and heard about in the news, and you're like, whoa, what if that happened here? So any of those could be used as questions or prompts for you to figure out or, or for the businesses that you may be working with who may approach you. Um, to figure out what they can do to prevent or what they can do to respond, right? So I think that's there's some like planning that needs to take place. But then obviously, that's there are always going to be things that you didn't plan for. And so then that's when I also think it's super important to hear what the survivor's needs are. Are you going to be able to address or meet them all? Maybe not, but there will maybe some that you're able to. And if you've already planned, then hopefully you, you have a good amount covered. Um, I would say that the other thing is that, you know, back to my comment earlier about when initially the NFL or even some of our clients that come to us, you know, they often come to us when there's a crisis that they're facing. And that's because, oh, they're the people that know about sexual violence. Let's go to them. But they often want to address that thing that just happened, the immediate uh, situation. And we often we always want to work on changing the culture of their environment. That's what we always want. But what one of the things that we've learned is that's not what they need at the moment. And so we accept that. We accept that what they need is very um, specific, uh, something much more narrow than what we really want to do, but we use it as an opportunity. I would say the same thing with the NFL is that they came to us and we said, well, let's just get our foot in the door and then we'll keep trying to build on this relationship. And I think that that has happened with a number of the, the partnerships that we have. And I think it's a matter of you getting to learn about them and them getting to learn about you and building trust because when you build trust and when you show your value, people are going to come back to you. And that has been, I think, one of the things that we've learned is to be patient and to um, understand that, yeah, it's maybe a Band-Aid at the beginning, but we are going to have to rip off that Band-Aid and try to go deeper and really solve what the, 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 the deeper wound is or the deeper problem is. Um, and again, and I think that... I, I mean, actually, raise your hand if you, you're, where you work has ever been approached by any kind of a business or other professional organization for any level of help around some kind of harm. Okay, so there are quite a few of you. Um, in that, have you been able to step up and offer what they did, or have you referred them on to somewhere else? You've been able to, to, to do? And, uh, have you been able to? Okay, great. Well, I want to invite all of you to see yourselves in the way in that way because none of us have had the answers. But what we have had is we have a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience. And our knowledge and our experience and our commitment and our passion, it's transferable. <laughs> we can transfer it and change it like we've done with all of the different grant programs and all of the different needs for survivors. These are survivor needs also, and we can um, step in and, and because we're coming from a good place and we have information and we, we're listening to somebody and their needs, and are, do they always want what we think they need? No, but if we're patient and we're there, I mean, and that has been our experience, and I think that's one of the things that we've learned is hang in there because what we know we want is to change, help them change their culture. 
And little by little by little, they, they'll keep coming back to us. And we have people that have told us, we're going to work with you for this number of years, and that's it. And then we're like, oh, OK, well, well we're, gonna, we're not going to accept that. So we'll just keep going and keep pushing and keep pushing. And guess what? It keeps working. So <laughs> I want to invite you all to see yourselves in that way. Don't just say, well, that's not what we do. I mean, you want to refer people to Reliance. We're happy to do that, too. But I want to encourage you to um, be there. I want to I want to call out Yolanda for a minute because we had a, a, a very, very large client that international, <laughs> the prospective client. We never got to work with them, but we were pretty we were scared because we're like, we don't think we can handle this. But they were asking us, we were like, yeah, we can do this and we can do that. And, you know, I don't know if we really could, but we were, we were going to try. But we were going to, we were going to build it. And then they asked for something and I was like, no, you know, no, I don't think, no, we're not going to be able to do that. And you are like, yes, we can. And it was, you know, what about if we uh, had needs in all these different communities? And I was like, well, we don't have all that. And she's like, yes, we can. And then it was like, oh, well, yeah, we can. And then, you know, we were thinking of all of you, like, let's bring them in and partner with them. And they're the, the, the boots on the ground to help support in those communities. And that is something that in terms of as our work evolves that we would really love to do is to have partners throughout that we can say, look, you have uh, people that have been harmed. Let's refer them to the local program but you're going to pay, you have to pay up <laughs> because, yeah, they have money to do it, but that's not what, you, you have money too. So you, as accountability for you, you should pay them for the, them to serve the survivors that you're sending forward, right? And we want you all to have the infrastructure and interest in taking those referrals because some of the people we were trying to refer to was like, oh, we don't know, we, we don't take money. I was like, yes, you do. You take donations, don't you? You take money. Please take some money. They're going to give you some money. And then we said, well, okay, we'll give it to them in a donation. But, you know, accountability in that way, accountability in, um, you know, what are you going to do about the people that caused harm if they're, you know, if they're going to be there? Let's get them some help. Let's make sure that they learn so that they don't continue to harm. So anyway, I think I'm going on, but my, my invitation to all of you is to see the expertise that you have and think about, just like we do with survivors, how can we help um, develop options and choices and center them. Think about these places that are coming to you because they actually need some help and they might not need what you think they need, but you might help get them there eventually. We're going to move it over to questions now, and I'm just going to put the last question for the team up on the screen, because I, I think now we're at a point where folks maybe have some wheels turning and are thinking about how do we reimagine these systems. And I really want to thank and acknowledge the grounding that as we think about what this looks like, survivors and their needs are at the foundation of that. I've heard, Monica, you say it countless times where you're like, we... Uh, come from the work. We are the work and survivors are at the root of all the work that we do. Yolanda saying, yes, we can do that because we have services and allies in every community. And that's you all in this room. That's everyone at this conference. That's everyone following along on this conference on social media who couldn't be here this week. And then with what Sandra had just shared too, and, and um, Karen with the, the work that you've done with partnerships and collaboration too. So really want to thank you all for that. And now turn it over to you all for what questions do you have for us? What's, what's bubbling up for folks. And Megan is going to run the microphone as she sees hands. Thank you. Um, my question is what bubbled up for me was I, I work with victims, I'm survivors, and just recently I had a survivor who worked at this organization who was assaulted by a co-worker and who deeply wanted this co-worker never do this again to someone else, but at the same time did not want to go the punitive. It's like, what am I going to gain if he is in prison and his kids are going to grow up without a dad? So the whole following the conversation we had here, I, I didn't know really what to say to that because my knowledge, it's, yeah, you go report, there's going to be a punitive probably, you know, road taken. So are there any resources that we can use where we can, when we do have survivors who 
want to go a different work with organization, within work organization, that we can, um, you know, refer them to and say, hey, go to sister, com sister reliance, you know, who, will, who are there to help people like you to see if they can contact the organization and help them, so. It's, it's a great question, and so I'm, I'm going to take a page from the Reliance Playbook and say, you ask for it, we will need to build it. I mean, truthfully, right? Like, again, we are backing into building this muscle of what are some of these outcomes. And for me, you know, when we have this conversation, and the beauty of Reliance is we have a lot of conversations, which is how we're building out or saying we're going to build all these things because we have a lot of great ideas, um, was the campus space. That was the first space for me professionally um, where I've had the opportunity with two of our largest, most prestigious institutions, I won't call by name, in North Carolina who created alternatives um, on college campuses specifically because so many of our black and brown survivors, that was literally their response is, hey, I don't want this person committing sexual assault, but I mean, I'm not trying to send a black man to jail at 18, so what other alternatives are there? And we had two amazing law professors sit down, and we took two years to build out a process, and it has been interesting the things that survivors – um, who came, what they came up with, with what those outcomes. One of those was one of our rape crisis centers was a down about $25,000 because the, the person who caused harm was extremely wealthy. And the survivor said, I, I wanted to give the money to the rape crisis center who provided my free therapy, right? That was not on our list of things that we would have been building out naturally. Um, and the rape crisis center literally was like, wait, are we supposed to take this money? And I was like, you just wrote a grant for government money. Yes, yes, you should. Um, and you can't. I mean, so, so, so again, that, that wasn't led by me or the, our work group that was creating this, because we have roundtables asking survivors, what outcomes would you want to see? Um, and we literally left it open. Now, one of the things that I also have learned with the campus work, which is where, for me, this work started, was what we built out for those two institutions is we also are using, or they are using a risk assessment, right? Because the campus does have some thoughts around safety. So we, there is not a risk assessment that really existed. And so one professor created a risk assessment internally to their university along with survivor input. That, and before anything moves forward with deciding accommodations or anything outside of their campus judicial system is both parties have to be in agreement with this, meaning the survivor has the access to the information from the risk assessment that, that they're asking so that they are fully aware of here's what we've learned now what's your recommendation, what to do. It's been interesting. It's been up and running for two years. I think that's the muscle we're going to have to build in this work as well, right, is how do we also help workplaces? Um, because, again, workplaces have, they don't have a judicial hearing, but they certainly have an HR process um, that's built into liability. So how do we also start writing um, policies to help companies also be open to creating what we've created, for me, my experience on the campus culture. But it's work that we haven't done, and it's work we're going to have to do. Again, my call to you all is, as you're talking to survivors, start collecting what are people saying they really want? What is just and fair and accountability look like to each survivor and start to hold that to create options? But it is work that we're going to have to do. I saw lots of hands. so. Please keep your hand up for a second so I can keep track of who. So okay. I just wanted to add on this to make, make sure we were clear. We haven't had that question asked of us. So that's why Monique is like, hey, we have to build it. So if you have other like questions that are specific like that, um, that you're learning, send them to us because then we can see what role we can play without stepping on your shoes. Because that's what I wrote down here. What role can we play to be supportive without stepping into advocacy space? Because that's your role. And so that's what I have here. So I am taking notes on how do we support without stepping on shoes. Thank you. Um, my name is Brittany, and I want to uh, maybe take it in a different direction. Um, I love the example you gave about the, you know, the partner that you were looking to bring in and calling, you know, all of us in as consultants. And for me, a part of um, accountability is looking at pay equity and structures and that money that you might give to the rape crisis center may not come to me as the outreach coordinator, the therapist, or whoever who's actually going to be doing that work. So is there a, a, a the potential to build our 
individual capacity to do that, whether it's helping get licensed or maybe somebody wants to be a consultant or to be able to build their own personal portfolio outside of the Rape Crisis Center because that money might not trickle down to us as individuals, if that makes sense. Reliance um, is planning to, we do use consultants and we expect in the future we'll have to use many more. So I think there is a, a possible track there. Yeah, I was just gonna say we do both and. So we do reach out to uh, different rape crisis centers and we do have consultants. So um, if their rape crisis center is the best space for us to go to, then we go that way. But we do have individual consultants uh, and with our psychoeducation um, sessions, those are individual consultants. We've learned that that's the best space for us for, for those sessions. But I did write that down too. I really appreciate um, what you were saying, and I what bubbled up for me, it's not necessarily a question, but I was thinking about, um, and I was sharing um, with here with my coworker here, that, um, you know, my daughter also, like, kind of in high school, experienced, you know, being harassed at school by a peer that, so my kids are mixed, uh, uh, triracial, tricultural. And so um, one of the students was a, 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 a kid of color and was harassing her and said some very derogatory things to her. And um, when I asked, like, well, do you need mama to come in? What do you want me to do? <laughs> and it's always, I always ask, do you want me to get involved? And the answer is usually no. Um, mom, I don't want this kid of color to get in trouble. And so when you said that, and I'm like, we're, you know, just thinking about that preventative side of like, these are things that our kids, our, our kids of color are already thinking about other kids of color because they're seeing all this, this punitive system. And it's like, where do we stop it? Like, where, where does that start? Where does that, um, so anyway, it, it really kind of just, I, that's not really a question, but really, I guess something for all of us to think about, about the work that, you know, we're trying to do and what prevention means, I guess. Thank you. That's a very poignant example. I would just say culture change, I think, has to start with very, very young people and then take time. Thanks for sharing that. I saw a hand over here and then one over there as well. Hi. So in the spirit of reimagining accountability, I, I wanted to ask, in, um, I, I really want to ask about a balance. Um, I'm reframing uh, a value that you probably have in terms of addressing people's needs, assessing their needs, making sure you respond to their needs. I heard that a lot. I heard um, making sure your expertise is seen, and um, I wonder if there's a possible reframe around, and, and I'd like to hear about how you do this, the, not just the needs of your clients, but the assets and the opportunities for them to lead and to grow. Um, and whether or not that's a part of how you can reimagine accountability, too. Um, just an example, an uh, organization that I supported years ago um, made sure that the survivors were able to be in groups and have group conversations without staff, without people present, and trying to encourage mutual support of each other. And the Spanish-speaking folks felt like they didn't have a place where they could really be seen and heard and talk. And so the first impulse for the organization was to get an interpreter to work with them. But there were a couple of women in that group who said, we can lead the group. We can do some interpretation. And long story short, that group started. They were able to do that to the point where they really thrived. Folks got to see these women in their leadership, and they became interpreters outside of the organization for other things as well. So just raising that, what was bubbling up for me is beyond a framework of assessing needs and being responsive to needs. What about assessing um, 
strengths, and opportunities for leadership and growth. So I'll give an example uh, and that, well, in my mind, this is the only way for me to answer this question, uh, is just give an example of, um, and I'll just say a tech company. So uh, we have all, you, we live in a space that so we're always connected to tech in some way, right? So a tech company, you know, creates different things, different apps for us to work with and um, created an app. It's an app specific to, um, black people, but didn't have any black people involved in it, but advertise it for black people. And, you know, we learn about it and, oh, you, they're coming to us for something completely different. But we're sitting here, we look like what we look like. And so we are here for something else. But when we work with companies, and even though they might bring us in for a bite, we learn these different aspects about the company because we built trust with them. They might only bring us in for maybe, they think, three to six months, but it comes out to be years. So we get to learn all these different things, and we take those opportunities with those listening ears and start to give them suggestions in other spaces. So you built this app for these black people, and you have no black people involved. So we're going to kindly tell you how, what a poor decision that was. So the next, and not only did you not have any black people involved, but because you trusted us and now your black staff have let us know how much that hurt. So now we're in a space that we can tell you the feedback that we got from your black staff. And now your, your, your black partners and can tell you how, what type of mistake that was. So now you're in a space, yeah, I forget what type of convenient it was, but I won't say it because then you know what tech company it was, um, <laughs> that you, they created a space to be able to hear from their staff, because it was only for their staff, to hear from their developers on what that was. So we weren't there for that reason, but that's a space of growth for them. So that's not the reason we were there, but that's one of the things that you got from having us at your table. So I want to give that an example. So even though we might be there for a bite, it doesn't mean we're not there listening. And hopefully that they'll, once you have us there, that you'll also learn from the different experiences that we have, even though you might have us there for one thing, because it all overlaps, it's all connected. And we're, we're here to help you with your community at your, your place of employment, and this all matters. So that's the example that I want to give if, with a tech company that we work with. Thanks for that, Yolanda. Powerful example. And I appreciate the question, too, and kind of the, the challenge that comes with it. I think you're right. I think there are more opportunities to be had. Um, so in addition to us responding to the needs of a company, they have a lot of influence sometimes, especially if they're a big, well-known company. Uh, they might have advertising space. They might have sponsors or partners that they could introduce us to, you know, in addition to, um, to just money. So, yeah, I think there are a lot of, lot of opportunities that we can explore. And I think that's, that's the wave of the future. I'm kind of excited about that. Let's see two more hands. Do we have time for two more questions? Yes, and I, I'm hoping I can add one more thing. Audrey, may I uplift your session from earlier today? Thank you. So... This calls a challenge that I think a lot of us have been struggling with, and I can speak from um, my own place of we're constantly talking about what we're against, what we're filling a gap of, but we're not focusing on um, strengthening what we're already good at and elevating that too. So um, Audrey, who asked this question, as soon as you said it, I was like, I am not surprised the person who presented on measuring love is talking about measuring strength, me measuring our strengths and, and activating on our strengths. So if this is still um, getting folks thinking a little bit deeper about this topic, Audrey's session this morning on, on um, measuring love was recorded and will be available on the National Sexual Assault Conference website. Hello again, sorry. Um, I think you may have actually partially already given a really good perspective on this question. Um, you had talked about earlier using prevention methods um, to 
put planning and development in place to prevent an organization operating in crisis mode. Um, and I think your perspective is a really good way to address if it already has happened. Um, and what are some, some suggestions you may have or thoughts of aiding an organization in the healing process, but at the same time already really in the depths of being in crisis mode and now it's become a norm to operate that way as well? Thanks. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of times um, businesses or, or corporations come to us because they are in crisis. We always want them to come to us before that happens, but it seems like that's just whatever <laughs> nature is that people don't feel that they need it until they, they are in crisis, and then all of a sudden there's a different level of receptivity. And so unfortunately, try as we might, we have one actually that isn't in crisis and hasn't been in the media, but I think maybe looking at other folks. So, um, you know, yeah, that's what we, we hope for. That's what we want. The reality is the other, which is people look at it when it hits their front door, then they're, they're, they're open and they're a little bit more receptive. And then that's when we can actually get in there and try and make suggestions. You know, some of the things that we do is help them to look at their practices, look at their policies, look at the training and education that they get, look at how they respond when somebody does come forward, and, and really try to help them to understand trauma, because people's lack of understanding of that often leads them to minimize and think that somebody's lying, because they just don't understand trauma, and specifically sexual trauma. And so, you know, give them that education. And it's been our experience, you know, so far is that, um, you know, you see a lot of light bulbs going off and people start to say, like, we had no under, no idea. And, and then little by little, I think, begin to want to go a little deeper and a little deeper. And I think the goal, because we are so interested in changing the culture, and, you know, the truth is you can make a... Um, an argument about protecting themselves from or reducing their risk of liability. I know that's a horrible angle, but it's the truth in terms of business that a lot of times that is what people are looking at. So let's look at risk mitigation. How can we <laughs> mitigate your risk, right? And, you know, reduce the likelihood that you'll get sued. And that sometimes is an entree through other departments and divisions who, you know, because everybody wants to protect that and their image, um, employee retention. You know, there are lots of ways because if employees are unhappy, and over the years we've seen, you know, employees have a lot more power in terms of, you know, using social media or going public or whatever and putting pressure on employers to make changes. We've seen that. And so that's another um, opportunity is to have help, you know, for employees to be, create the demand, actually. Uh, so um, I think that there are so many ways if you just think about what's it going to take to create a good environment. And again, I would think about it before you're actually, even you, if you're, if you want to be a part of helping organizations, think about it, get together with a group of other people and say, what would it take for our environment to make it really not just trauma informed, but preventative, um, you know, all of those things. And then um, that will serve as kind of a, a foundation for what you can do with others. We have a nice note that we're at 10 minutes, so I will let us ask the next question. Thank you. Um, I think a lot of us know that the current systems can perpetuate trauma for survivors, can cause harm just by going through the accountability process. And so as we're working to build new systems of accountability, what practices have you put in place or what suggestions do you have for making sure that that doesn't then continue the harm for survivors who are going through them? I know we've been working a lot on building our restorative justice capacity in Colorado to deal with sexual violence cases. And we have a lot of um, you, you know, concerns from the community that those practitioners are not necessarily familiar with sexual violence, the dynamics, the nuances, 
the impacts of trauma and that survivors will then be further harmed if they're seeking that alternative. And so I'm just curious on you know, what suggestions you have for advocating for more awareness or, or what you're doing to help make sure that, that, other, that when we're building new forms of accountability, they are considering that and, and hopefully um, not repeating the cycles we've seen in other systems. It's a great question. And it, the, the first thing that I would say is, and this is, I'm going to give the hard answer that, you, that may seem unkind first. We can't gatekeep this. Right? We cannot go in assuming other people don't know how to center people. They may not understand sexual violence, but we have to go in to see what the strengths are for whatever system we're building. Right? We live, so some of you know, especially those of you in North Carolina, I live within a practice of abundance and not scarcity. So to do this work, we have to believe that other people have experiences and expertise that can be unimaginable to us because we've been in our own silos. So I'm not saying that there aren't people who could cause harm, but I am saying that there are people who could be a great help to us if we open our hearts and our minds and most importantly our ears about where their assets are and where ours are lacking and build the partnership to create, again, the muscle. That's not a muscle we practice in this work. We don't practice opening the door to the expertise of other organizations and other partners. So that's the first thing that I would say, is I'd start from abundance. Um, and then the second thing that I certainly would say um, is, as much as we'd like to not cause harm, this is what I tell my daughter, people gone people. <laughs> we just are. And we are going to cause harm. The difference is the accountability and the acknowledgement and intentionality that the goal is to be productive and helpful. And when you do that from a space of what are our assets, people understand harm differently when you are clear that we are building this. So we can't open the doors and say to survivors, hey, y'all, we got, we're reimagining accountability. We're going to create these new structures. Every system that exists thought that. What we can say is we need to do this and we're going to do it by hearing you, which is why that was my call to you. Collect what you're hearing. Where, let's asset map what exists out there for us to start looking at how we build the accountability. We, I told everybody who asked me, we, are, we have no answer. What we do have is the willingness and the, for me, the openness to do something different and to do it from a place of abundance and acknowledge that we're certainly not going to get it right but we haven't gotten it right yet. Um, and I'd also say that I think almost all of us operate in crisis. And one, one last plug for one of the things that we did that's in the front of your book that I um, is think is something we can talk to all organizations and businesses, including our own, and that's a code of conduct, right? Like, so set the tone for who you are. What's your culture? We can ask that of our partners. That's a thing that we can easily give back to survivors who aren't sure what they're ready to do. Um, and we can talk about what's the code of conduct? How, how are we going to do life together? Because working with people is doing life with them. We're spending a lot of our time there. So not an answer, but a place. Mostly I wanted to say this because it's important to me that we not gatekeep this work and assume that we have the answers. I promise you if we did, we wouldn't be here. We're going to have to build it. Uh, I, I mean, I cannot imagine a better way and a better note to end on. <laughs> um, I will give an opportunity for um, our leadership team to give any of their, their last thoughts or, or parting thoughts or statements. Um, also, along the lines of what Monica just said, we may have stirred up more questions than answers for you all. And with acknowledgement of that, if you want to reach out to any of us, our contact, well, not my contact information, their contact information, um, is up on the slides. Um, and you can also reach any of our team members at info at reliance.org. want to thank you all and hand it back over to you if you have any last final thoughts you want to leave our folks with today. Yeah, I just noticed that... Um I don't have the same email as Monica, but it's up there as the same. Um, <laughs> uh, 
It's simply my first letter, my first name, and my last name. All of our emails are set up that way. But uh, just want to thank all of you for coming to see us and joining in the discussion. And again, just continue to send us emails, send us your thoughts. And I do believe that we are a community and we do really, really do work together. That's why when Sandra said it that, hey, I know we can meet the need. I don't know how we were going to do it, but because of all of you, I knew we could do it. So thank you so much. I also thank you, and I'm just going to lift up something that Jack um, Patrici, our Gail Byrne Smith Award winner, said this morning at the plenary. She said, compassion without accountability is complicity. Accountability without compassion is dominance. So we're going for accountability with compassion and with options. So thanks for helping us to build them. I want to thank those of you who stuck around with us because most of the time you go to a workshop hoping someone gave you an answer. And so I kept, hopefully you heard me reiterating, this is really a call for partnership um, to build a new muscle and a new system of care um, because accountability is about a system of care as well. And hopefully people can see um, a new way to, for me, I'm asking people to see accountability is not harmful, but as a part of how we take care of each other and ourselves. So thank you for sticking with us. Thanks, and uh, I, everybody said it, but yeah, I think that we all want to be believe that we can prevent these uh, inappropriate behaviors, and we all have to be a part of it, and that means all of us in the room, all of us at this conference, all of us that do this work, but also other folks that have something to bring to the table and that, you know, they can really benefit from what we bring and to, to really create something strong. So help us be a part of kind of charting the future and uh, changing the world. Thanks.